Support Wrestle Talk. Support each other. For the past couple of weeks, the Black Lives Matter movement has made headlines across the world, with protests taking place seeking justice for the murder of George Floyd, as well as highlighting systematic racist prejudices. Several members of the WWE roster have spoken on the situation, including Xavier Woods' heartbreaking speech about how he has always had to present himself as non-threatening, as well as the rest of the New Day sharing their feelings on their podcast. According to tweets from NXT talent AJ Francis, in what was said to be a uniting moment for the NXT locker room, Triple H made a speech to them before and after NXT TakeOver In Your House, saying that if anyone at any point wanted to speak with him about Black Lives Matter, he was happy to have that conversation. The movement itself was represented on Keith Lee's jacket and trunks on the show. However, during the taping of In Your House, Fightful is reporting Shawn Michaels got in a heated debate with another NXT producer over these racial issues. The other unnamed producer was heard to say that everyone already gets treated the same, which according to the report, set off Michaels immediately, who broke down systematic racial inequality and prejudice to this producer. The two were said to work with each other without incident following the confrontation, so hopefully some of Michaels' message got through. But quick, real issues make me uncomfortable. Let's talk about normal wrestling stuff, like WWE exploiting Jeff Hardy's very real addiction problems for a storyline. Oh god damn it WWE. Jeff Hardy was involved in a controversial angle two weeks ago on SmackDown, where he was framed drunkenly running over Elias in a car. Hardy was taken away in cuffs, an uncomfortable image given his previous arrests for DWI just eight months ago in October. But it won't stop there, as according to a report from Sportskeeda, there will be a big angle on this week's Go Home episode of SmackDown that was taped earlier this week. We're now entering the spoiler room brawl so skip ahead to the dynamite review if you want that angle to remain unspoiled although to be honest it's going to be rubbish no matter how much you know going in. Apparently Hardy and Sheamus will be involved in one of the most controversial contract signings in WWE history, which will see Hardy confronted by a man in a lab coat and four security guards, while Sheamus asks for assurances before their match at Backlash, asking Hardy for a urine test. Leaning into another dark incident from Jeff's past, where Sting had to cut their main event match at TNA Victory Road short because he was in no state to perform. Hardy will admit that he has a problem before, swerve, throwing the urine into Sheamus' face. What do you think about Jeff throwing the PP at an Irish man? Let me know in the comments because I'll be replying to people from out of the realization that saying these words is my job. Before we get into that AEW Dynamite review, there is sad news that wrestling legend Mr. Wrestling 2 Johnny Walker has passed away aged 85. While only working for the then WWF for two years from 1984 to 1986, Walker held numerous titles across the NWA, Deep South Wrestling, Georgia Championship Wrestling and more. Walker has also been inducted into the NWA, Pro Wrestling and WCW Hall of Fames. There's a bunch more news today so click the WrestleTalk.com links in the video description below for Chris Jericho revealing who he originally wanted in the inner circle. Shayna Baszler calling out Becky Lynch for getting pregnant again and more details on the return of New Japan. But now it's time for last night's AEW Dynamite in about five minutes. Thanks for your support on Patreon. Don't have a Shane Cowley man. The show opened on FTR's debut match in AEW against The Butcher and The Blade, where they continued what seems to be their new FTR entrance gimmick. Full stop there at ringside. In a car. <coughs> Moving on.
Chris Jericho was brilliant on commentary throughout the night, although a four-man booth was too much. But he wasn't the only person interested in FTR's first ever Dynamite match. Sean Spears, Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson were also in the crowd watching on, while also posing for their Christian rock band album cover. FTR worked as quite literal babyfaces in the match, not just with Butcher and the Blade beating up Cash Wheeler, but also for Dax Harwood having shaved off his magnificent moustache. Stand down, moustache break. Stand down. It was weird to see the former Revival work babyface, but Dax's hot tag was brutally effective and they won with the assisted Spike Piledriver. It wasn't the big Arrival performance FTR might need for AEW viewers only aware of their terrible main roster run in WWE, but the post-match angle made up for that, having FTR, the Young Bucks and tag team champions Kenny Omega and Hangman Page in a three-way standoff. AEW's tag division is insane. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for the women's division. Penelope Ford pinned Shida in a tag match with Nyla Rose and Chris Statlander respectively, using the title behind the referees back to win. In yet another episodic instalment where nothing really seems to progress. Darby Allen showed us his cut of Botchamania Noir, complete with Tony Hawk cameo! Oh my god, please let there be a skateboarding feature for the AEW video game. With Jericho watching on, Jake Hager, Santana and Ortiz took on the best friends in a six-man tag, where the heels jump the faces right away, all building to that Orange Cassidy hot tag, which was more of a, a lukewarm tag. Lukewarm, name of Luke's wrestling persona, who used his unique low-effort offense to take out everyone and win with a surprise pinning combination. This angered the inner circle, so Jericho joined them for a post-match beatdown, including hitting Cassidy with a bag of oranges. That's like, a f I think it's a form of cannibalism. Busting him open hard way, giving him the juice. I'm back in the game. MJF then started a feud with Billy Gunn at ringside, setting up a match for them next week. Colt Cabana lost to Sammy Guevara in a match built around how both men needed a win, which was followed by the Dark Order coming out in full force. Complete with the previously trapped in Canada, title of your pay-per-view, Evil Uno and Stu Grayson and Mr. Brody Lee, who helped up Colt Cabana, who followed them backstage. Colt! The clue's in the name! This was the first time we've seen the Dark Order together since the Exalted One's debut. I was skeptical about how all their different looks would work in unison, but thankfully they appear more than the sum of their parts, having the same kind of mismatched awesomeness as New Japan's L.I.J. Still in the ring, Sammy was then confronted by version 1 Matt Hardy, complete with Matt Fact graphics saying, Matt often craves mofongo, which, I googled it, is actually a Puerto Rican dish, not a racist wrestling gimmick from the 80s, or 90s, or possibly the noughties. I, I guess it also could have been as as recent as last decade. Matt told Sammy he could be so much more, but he needs to get away from Jericho, further sowing seeds for the long-term Guevara babyface turn, before turning into Broken Matt and threatening to delete him. Joey Janela teased the new team with Sonny Kiss. Moxley cut an intense promo on Taz and Brian Cage before being jumped by them in the parking lot. And the main event saw Cody Rhodes defend his TNT title against private party's Mark Quinn, who was awesomely accompanied out by their new mentor, Team Extreme Matt Hardy. That's, a, that's another box ticked on my Matt watching list. This open challenge gimmick is a masterstroke. Not only do viewers know they're going to get a likely very good title match every week. Not only is it the perfect device to get over younger wrestlers, but it also creates a terrifically compelling story around Cody, as he compounds more and more wear and tear on his body, turning him in to the underdog babyface. He made Quen tap out by applying the same grapevine ankle lock with some kind of knee bar moderation on Mark's injured leg, cementing a cool submission finish to his repertoire. But there was at least four minutes left of the show which can only mean one thing, in a circle brawl time. Jake Hager came out, pushed over Arn Anderson, prompting a heels versus faces brawl with Hardy and Isaiah Cassidy, joining Cody and Quen. Cody booked him versus Hager for Fighter Fest next month. 
That was this week's Dynamite in about five minutes. Let me know what you thought of the show in the comments below because I'll be replying to people from out of nowhere asking, do you like oranges? Well then, how do you like them oranges? This was a very solid episode yet again, slowly building the men's division. The women's division feels like it's been stuck on a treadmill since the show started. By AEW's very high standards, this week's Dynamite is middle of the roads. Can you do better? Then maybe you should apply for the new lead writer position on SmackDown that WWE is currently advertising, likely to replace the recently fired Krista Joseph. Go follow us on Twitter at WrestleTalk underscore TV and pitch your best angles and storylines to get the job. Or... More likely, have them read out on this Saturday's Smackdown Review podcast. Click the link in the video description below for that. Chris Van Vliet was on last night's Quizzle Mania, but not, I repeat, not Louis Dangor. Click the video on the right to watch Quizzle Mania 11. And Vince McMahon is reportedly angry with Randy Orton. Click the video beneath that to find out why. And remember, go follow us at WrestleTalk underscore TV on Twitter and me at Ollie Davis, because I've been Ollie Davis and that was wrestling.